together uh, voluntarily. And we organize ourselves in a national convention meeting next week in Columbus, our annual meeting. And also state conventions are another breakdown of that organization. And on the local level, individual churches um, get together. They are a part of what is called an association of churches. Again, voluntary for the purpose of doing missions. Because, let's face it, there are a lot of things that we can do with many churches that an individual church would struggle to do on its own. And I believe God has blessed the pattern of Southern Baptist life um, and mission work that we do and the way that we organize for that. At the association level, uh, churches agree upon and uh, call a director of missions. And that, to me, is a very descriptive title that tells uh, the whole watching world what we're about. We're about representing Jesus Christ in our communities and around the world. Some of you are new to Southern Baptist Life, and I want to take a moment to explain that and introduce our speaker today. Uh, Brother Cliff Hartley is our Director of Missions in the Ohio Buckeye Central Erie Baptist Association. But Brother Cliff is more than that to this congregation. He is a very dear friend and a dear brother in the Lord. And so would you please welcome Brother Cliff, and you come, sir, and lead as the Lord leads you. Bill, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 18 for a moment or two this morning as us late Nick P. Rooney told to us his eight wives, I won't hold you very long this morning. You'll get it tomorrow. <laughs> How many of you would rather be here this morning than sitting on the side of the road where the state patrolman just pulled you over? <laughs> We're glad to be back at the First Baptist Church in Belleville. Glad to be back with our dear friends uh, Bill and Chris. And uh, I've always been treated very warmly, friendly being here. And uh, feel like at home when I come to this church. And thank you for the relationship and preparing for the meeting today. I appreciate that so well. And I enjoyed the uh, Sunday school lesson this morning. And uh, the coffee was, did you make the coffee? Man? Chris made the coffee. Better than McDonald's, not my dad. Uh, my style of coffee is black and bitter and glad to get her. And it was just... <laughs> well, well, uh, so, we are excited about what God is doing in our association, and I won't take too much time to talk uh, about that, but I have a plaque here that I want to introduce you to. It has my name indirectly on it. It could have been First Baptist Church of Belleville's name on it, in recognition of your contribution of lighting up Ohio through church planting in 2014. State Convention of Baptists in Ohio, uh, Church Planting Resource Group. And that was presented to us last year. I was not there to receive it at the State Convention Association, State Convention meeting last year. I was uh, in the hospital having gone through two surgeries and just finished another one on this shoulder back in April. I'm 11 days, uh, 11 days I'll be totally slingless. <laughs> I'll be free from this, uh, from this sling that I'm wearing. Back in October, I had an accident that took out the entire left side. The uh, knee went out, the hip went out. My shoulder went out, and this past April, the surgery was the third surgery of three, and uh, progressing fairly well. Uh, still can't tie a tie, the reason why I don't have one on this morning. I normally preach in a three-piece suit, as well as going to the beach in a three-piece suit, <laughs> but can't tie my shoestrings. I wear a zipper of boots, and I can't even tie up George Walker Bush, that's my golden retriever dog. 
So I am what I am this morning, and if you don't like it, you'll just have to deal with it, and I'll be out of your way soon. And I asked the pastor, I said, when are you over? He said, about, uh, about 12. He didn't say which 12. So I may not get another chance standing in this pulpit, so I may take the second 12. The Hartleys now are at an even dozen. My youngest, or my grandson, rather, my third grand, second grandchild, just got married. He is a senior youth pastor at one of our churches down in Jersey. He, uh, he preaches to about three or four hundred young people every Sunday. And he's part of the Jersey Baptist Church, where one of our church pastors, John Hayes, is pastor. And uh, he just married a little RN back in 23rd of May. Took off on a two-week vacation down to the Hawaii. And I thought if he ever got down there, I'd never get him back again. But he did come home. And uh, they're living now in Columbus, so that makes an even 12. I still have two grandchildren that are not married yet. Kara will be a sophomore at Liberty University this fall. And Nathan is a uh, going to be a talent, uh, accomplished pianist, uh, just like your pastor here. And he's going to be in music, and if he doesn't start preaching, we'll kill him at 5 o'clock on Friday and tell God that he died someplace. But all of our family are involved in the Lord's work, and we're grateful for that. But part of our work among Southern Baptists, uh, uh, work throughout the country and the world, I want to hear, I want to stand here and not to raise any money from this church, but I do want to thank you for what you're doing. We have 32 churches within our association. Uh, God has allowed us to see three brand new churches started in 2014. We are working with three additional churches that are already constituted churches in their own right to align themselves with Southern Baptists and our association in 2015. We've been very, very busy in trying to do the work that God has called us to do, and that is to make disciples to make disciples. That's very simple, but yet it's sometimes it's a very hard matter as well as long-term matter to do. So the state convention uh, is hosting this year, the first time ever, the national convention, the Southern Baptist Convention in Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio, in our back door. First time ever in Ohio and probably we'll never see it happening in Ohio again, maybe not in our lifetime. So we have the privilege of having Dr. Ronnie Floyd, who is our state national, national convention president, and uh, he is a man of prayer, he is a man of revival, and he's going to be implementing those two things during this convention uh, this week, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Now, this is not political. I don't think it is political. But somewhere the political world has gotten their nose into our tent in trying to establish what is, I believe, the forthcoming same-sex marriages. It's before the Supreme Court right now. Ireland has already gone, set the pace for an entire nation of endorsing this kind of a lifestyle. It's before our Supreme Court. It's my understanding and belief that the Supreme Court will endorse it. That we'll enter into an agenda that will uh, be a lifestyle implemented into our country beyond what you and I will to be. We are still, those of us who are here this morning, those of us are still the salt and the light of the world. And if we were not the salt, it would be far better uh, far worse than what it is. Now, I want somebody to prove me wrong on this under the direction of Dr. Ronnie Floyd, who is now the president of our Southern Baptist Convention, who believes in a strong, mighty movement of prayer and revival. What will turn this country around when we're facing same-sex marriages unlike a revival? I don't know if anything else can do it. If we don't have revival in this country, this country is headed for ruin, in utter ruin, and in a short time. We need to be praying, and in much prayer, if you cannot attend that prayer meeting uh, this week in Columbus, 
You need to be praying at home somewhere that God will reach our people. The Southern Baptist Network is by far the greatest network of evangelism that the world knows anything about. You have the opportunity of giving toward missions around the world. A small church can be a part of the missionary program just exactly like a big church. I attended the plain, uh, the, uh, in Plano, Texas two years ago of the Prestonwood Baptist <coughs> Church. You know that church indirectly <coughs> and you see him on TV, Dr. Jack Brown, who is on that program. When we were there, they gave us a bulletin just like I received a bulletin this morning and they had some numbers on there of the previous week. One of which of their attendance was just a few hundred shy of 15,000 people in Sunday school at one time at one place. Can you imagine? The offerings was just a few dollars shy of one million dollars one week. We can't get our arms around that coming from a small from a small town. God's not forgotten small people, small towns. But what we can get our arms around that in relation to that church in Plano, Texas, was out of 15,000 people, only six people had made decisions in that previous week out of that massive crowd. We can do that here. We can see six people want the Lord out of our congregation here. And while we do not diminish six people being saved in matter, no matter what kind of church, there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that gets saved. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Certainly you would think out of 15,000, more than six people can be saved. That goes to prove the point that what Jesus told us to do and continue to do and he, until he comes, we have done a very, very poor job of doing it. We've not done it very well. While the church has not bottomed out, it certainly has not topped out. Two percent of any given congregation, two percent, that's rounded out with a hundred in attendance. Two people out of a hundred in attendance ever wins anybody to Christ. Two out of a hundred. And those that do win people to Christ out of a hundred never ever brings their converts to full maturity in discipleship. The numbers does not even register. It takes years and years and years and years to disciple a person into the disciple where they can go out and do the very same thing that you just done to them. Jeannie has often said that no child should ever be born until they're 16 years old. <laughs> Our churches today are growing, and those that are growing are not growing by discipleship. The numbers have fallen off drastically. The news media is promoting 200,000 people have withdrawn their membership from Southern Baptist people. The records of salvations have dropped. The records of baptisms have dropped. The records of discipleship training has dropped. The records of giving toward missions has dropped. Across the board. We have a great challenge today. There is a great challenge in front of our local churches today unlike we've ever seen them before. We have people today that are more concerned about their absence than they are about their presence. They think they can, churches can get along without me. The fact is that we can't. We need each and every individual being in their place round about the camp every time the doors are open. Amen. We have people today that are concerned about greed more than giving. They're not giving toward missions. They're not giving even toward their local churches. And the offerings have dropped. And we need a whole lot more sympathy in our churches today than there is apathy. Amen. There is that running wild and rampant. 
I think we're living in a very critical time, as well as a very historical time, about seeing national revival. Flag Day, I personally do not see America in the end time events. I believe it will fall by the wayside. I really do. The Bible is not about America. The Bible is about the Jews. And I'm not here to be political. But we have a president in our, in our White House, 1600 <coughs> Pennsylvania Avenue, that he summoned his nose toward Israel. Right. That continues to take place. Blessed will be blessed because we bless them. Cursed will be cursed because we curse them. I'm not saying whether they're right or wrong. They are God's chosen people. If we're about to see America survive, we're going to have to see her survive in a lot of issues today of where what they're talking about may be political issues, but they're really biblical issues. And we need people today standing stronger than ever before. And that's my message for you this evening. And I'm glad to be here with you this morning. And I have about 10 minutes to get a 30 minute message in. And I'll do my best. And uh, some of you are guilty of going to sleep during my sermons. <laughs> I'm not looking at you, Ray. I'm looking at that man over there. <laughs> Why do you seem to be so guilty? <laughs> was a lady that met her pastor at the door while he was shaking hands and she said, I want to apologize for my husband walking out during your sermon today. And he said, well, to be frank with you, it was really a little bit disconnecting. And she said, well, it wasn't because of you. So he's had a problem of sleepwalking since he was five years old. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> if any of you decides to go to sleep, fine. I'm worried if you start sleepwalking. And if you do start sleepwalking, then some of you need to get around him to protect him or her. So, a word to the wise for those of you on my specific left. God well, bless your heart. Bear with me for a few moments. I'm reading from the King James Version out of chapter 18. Sort of relax. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there and we are understanding that he was in the years here, not some times of brief. He departed, that is Paul, and went over all the country of Galatia and Pergia in order, strengthening all the disciples. Those of us who are strong, we are surrounded with many who are weak. And it's our responsibility to become all to them that God has asked us to become to them. Now I want you to consider for a moment or two this church or this city, Antioch. It was a church plant. A church plant from the mother church which was at Jerusalem. And if we were to study church history we find that the church of Antioch takes the premier setting rather than the first church in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, when Paul went out to do his missionary work, he spent much of his time raising missionary money for the mother church. The church of Antioch became Paul's home church. Some believe at least three, if not four, of all the recorded missionary journeys that is recorded about the Apostle Paul <coughs> stem from the Church of Antioch. The Church of Antioch was a church plant. 
just like the First Baptist Church of Millville, is a at one time a church plant. Someone started this church. I don't know, I'm sure there are those here that has the history of this church, of how it was started. And some of your family members were a part of it. Somebody started this church. And what should come out of First Baptist Church of Belleville is another church. <laughs> That's exactly what God has told us to do, is to go and make disciples, and not just make disciples as we go to Walmart, or as we go to Lowe's, as we go to the bank, but we are to go to make disciples specifically driven directly to them. On purpose, we are to go to their camp and to win them to Christ. We try to short-circuit short that by just simply throwing out a track here and there as we're going from point A to point B. But he has asked us to go into all the world and there preach the gospel, beginning at Jerusalem and then Samaria and then into the uttermost parts of the world. We are doing a very, very poor job of it, but yet that is what God has asked us to do. Joshua was charged of Moses that in the last days there will be an evil and wicked generation. Is there anybody here today that cannot say that we are living maybe there already? I do not know when Jesus will return, and neither do you, nor does anybody else. But I do know this. We're closer, 24 hours closer to His coming today than we were yesterday. Time is running out on all of us. Sometimes it runs out because of our physical disabilities. We're just simply not able to do what we used to do. We can't get up and go like we used to get up and go. Time is wasting away, wearing out on all of us. And if we do not do it now, who's going to pick up our legacy if we have a legacy to carry on? Why do some churches thrive and some churches just barely survive? Let me give you five things here just briefly to consider. We are lacking in our churches today of a true, genuine worship that is Christ-honoring, God-pleasing. Worship. What worship that we've seen here this morning where we were engaged in praising Him. What is included in our worship? Number one is to praise Him. God inhabits the praises of men. If there's anything that God desires, He desires the praise from men. That was one of the reasons why Satan got kicked out of heaven, because he refused to praise God Almighty. And God says, you'll never be back in my presence again. He was kicked out. The Bible says, rejoice with them that rejoice. When somebody comes to church and they get happy in the Lord and you're sitting in the same church or in the same pew, you better get happy in the Lord too. Because it is a command that we rejoice with those who rejoice. I don't know how you praise the Lord. I don't praise the Lord like other people and other people don't praise the Lord like I do. I've seen some people that praise the Lord by throwing songbooks. They get so happy, they'll just throw a songbook. I don't want to be where that songbook comes down. <laughs> I've seen some people praise the Lord by jumping pews. Go ahead and jump a pew. I don't want to be sitting in front of you when you hit the ground. If that's what turns you on and praise Him, do whatever it calls, whatever you want to do to praise Him. He inhabits the praises of men. He also wants true worshipers in the sense He wants people who are true worshipers. Did you come to worship God this morning? Amen. I hope so. <clears throat> but you can't be a true worshiper in hiding and holding out on God. If you've got things within your heart, for example, if there's somebody that you have not forgiven, you can't be a true worshiper. Hello? Just can't. <clears throat> I don't want to take responsibility to the pastor. But I'm going to try to help you out and I expect an amen from you. <laughs> if you're holding God, if you're holding out on tithes and offerings, you cannot be a true worshiper. You just simply cannot. Amen. 
He not only inhabits the praises of men, He seeks true worshipers. If we're going to have a worship service, we've got to have true worshipers. Makes sense to me. And then you've got to have some strong preaching. Preaching from the Word. Everything from Genesis 1-1 all the way through Revelation 22-21. And when you come here, you come here to learn. That's what causes churches to thrive and continue to on and continue on is to learn. Now we had a great Sunday school lesson this morning. And what I heard from Pastor Bill this morning, I could have heard from Pastor Todd in Orangeburg. Or from Mike Wilson in Mansfield. But what we did hear this morning, we heard learning from this place this morning. And that's what you get from churches that are thriving and being successful. Then churches that are in fellowship one with the other. Fellowship. Now Jeannie and I have just celebrated 52 years of marriage. Amen. She told her mother in the fourth grade she's going to marry Cliff Hartley. And uh, I told her that she was endowed with a very great deal of wisdom at a very early age. <laughs> she said she thought so too at the time. <laughs> well, there's never been a time that the relationship has ever been severed. There have been, from time to time, the fellowship has not always been right. And so it is with the local church. We're rightly related and rightly related so, but that does not always mean the voice in fellowship. Fellowship in agreement. In agreement on a common purpose, and that is to thrust the gospel into all the world. Now, another thing is because of your own local service, what God has called you to do. I don't know what God has called you to do, but I know that every person that's here this morning that's ever been born again has been endowed with a divine supernatural gift. Mm -hmm. God has given to you something specifically, watch it, to be plugged in to His work. That's right. That's right. And it calls for your work, your service, to make this church all that it can be. If you become disconnected, then this church is wailing and wanting and, and having a lot of missed desires. You've got to be plugged in. Do you know what God has called you to do? I hope so. If you do not know what it is, then discover it and then start to work at it and develop it Amen. to where it is pleasing unto Him. He that takes his hands off of the plow, the Bible says it's not fit for the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean that you won't go there. It just means that you're not fit to go there. God is not only looking for true worshipers. He is looking for true servants of God. Now, you can't be a servant of God without serving a master. And we don't call Jesus by his name, Jesus, any longer, that is, after we become born again. No true believer ever calls Jesus by Jesus after they become born again. When we use Jesus, we always use Jesus in referencing him that he is the Savior of the world to a lost person. But when we address him, it's not Jesus. We address him as Master and Lord. True worshipers, true servants of God, then people who are on the cutting edge of giving to missions around the world. Over $180 million was given to the Lottie Moon Missionary Offering last year. That goes strictly to missions on the world, in the world. Not one penny of it, not one dime, not any overhead that takes to raise that kind of money ever stays here. Every penny of it goes to missions around the world. You have the privilege of giving toward the cooperative program. That a lot of that money goes toward six seminaries that we have in America. Six seminaries, a place where they can go and to be taught and trained to do missionary work wherever God has called them. And whereas other missionaries goes out, that they have to go out on deputation, unlike the Southern Baptists, we are able to discharge our kids from our sent missionaries 
of seminaries and plug them right into the foreign fields of service immediately. That's a wonderful thing, and we get to be a part of that. The Southern Baptist Convention and Southern Baptist churches are no small piece of change. So, we are living also in that world with the, with the opportunities and the challenges that God has given to us, but all of us are living with these things right here. John, you're not sleepwalking, are you? No. <laughs> she is. I'm just chasing her. We're all, <laughs> we're all living with these things right here, and I would venture to say that if you're a person of accountability and responsibility, you've got one of these things in your shirt pocket or purse. We call the people who basically carry these things millennials. Millennials. And we're talking about strengthening the brethren. The millennials makes up somewhere between 80 to, 80 to 90 million people in America. Tom Rayner says, who is with Lifeway, they are the most educated generation that America has ever seen. The millennials. Let me give you some of the statistics about the millennials. They're 80 million strong. They are the largest educated generation in America. They are not church people. I'm talking about one third of the population of America. 300 million strong. 80 to 90 million are made up of millennials. They are not church people. Tom Rainer goes on to say 15% of them are Christians. And 20% of that 15% believes that going to church once a month is enough. They are non-worshipful people. They do not get engaged. They do not participate. They do not even carry their Bibles to church. I was in a church not long ago and I was the only one that had a tie on. I was the only one that had a suit on. And I was the only one carrying a Bible. They carry these. Now, as I read to you this morning, I read from the King James Version of Scriptures. That was the Bible that I was saved under. That was the Bible that my mother taught me. That was the Bible that I taught my children. That was the Bible that I led my, both of my children to the Lord. The King James Version is a, is a book that I've been preaching and pastoring for well over 40 years. Now look at me. I'm 71 years of age and I'm not about to change. I'm set in my ways. I'm not against anything else that you might use. I'm just King James. I don't try to jam that down somebody's throat. I'm just King James. I feel comfortable with it. I've done all my Bible memory from it. And I'm continuing to preach from it. A man walked into my church services the other day was not carrying a Bible. And he said, Preacher, he said, I don't care what version you preach from today, I got you covered. <laughs> All I need to do is to switch it, and I can get any version that you preach from today off of my smartphone, my iPhone. Hmm. Now, friend, I don't want to do away with my phone. I lost it yesterday. I thought I was going to berserk until I found it. <laughs> I can't do away with my phone. My dad used to say, don't talk to me about the good old days. There wasn't anything good about the good old days. But I don't want to go back to the days where I don't have my phone. I got all my contacts here. I got all my notes here. I got everything that I've ever drafted right here. I don't lose this. I get more work traveling. Don't tell Jeannie this. I get more work traveling over the highway watching what my phone is telling me than what it takes me to do when I get home in the evening. The millennials believe that losing this phone is far worse than losing their car. 
They get their news from this. We don't buy any books anymore. We we read them off of we read our books off of this. There's no five o'clock supper anymore around our family tables anymore. Very few families sit down and watch the six thirty news anymore. We get our news off of Facebook and Twitter. This is the millennial generation that has no desire to be where you are this morning. And if we do not have church plants like Antioch and disciples that will go there and disciple them, and many times it takes years to do it, this church that I'm looking at this morning in a matter of years will fail. If we do not have new blood and new blood that will come in to make our churches grow, but not only to make them grow, but to make them strong. Churches that can weather the storm, that can weather the problems, and see their way through it, and continue to preach the gospel, and honor simply what God has told us to do. Simply as that. 60 to 66 percent of the millennials elected President Obama not only once, but twice. He is for abortion. He is for the homosexuals. He is for same-sex marriages. He is against Israel. We elected him. And yet the Bible tells us not to ever speak evil of our leaders. But we certainly can address the sin issues. Amen. And that's what the salt and the light is supposed to do. And I want to challenge you this morning that we need to be strong and we need to ever be strengthening our brothers and sisters in the Lord's work, kingdom work. It can fail, and many churches do. Between 800 and 1,000 churches before 2015 is over will close their doors. And what a sad testimony when the light has gone out on the candle. We've got to move, and we've got to move now. And I'm challenging as director of missions, I'm challenging our pastors, and I'm challenging our, our parishioners to stay, to stay true to the Word. Not that I'm hearing that anybody has divorced themselves from the Word, but stay true to the Word. Stay true to their calling. Stay true to, to, through, true to their purpose. When Jeannie and I first were dating... I was driving a 1987 two-door hardtop candy apple red Chevrolet <laughs> with a 283, 283, 283 87 engine. I'd like to have a thousand of those today. I'd go pick her up on Marion Pike Street and go to the door and bring her out to the car, open the door for her and she would slide in and time I walked around in front of the car, came back and got back in on the driver's side, she had slipped from the passenger side all the way, almost all underneath the wheel. <laughs> Boy, I like that. <laughs> I really did. That was so cool. We'd go down and pass the corner of the B&B restaurant and all the guys and gals would be hanging out at that restaurant. We'd go through town, I'd blow the horn and I just, you know, I just, I was a cool dude and she was a slick chick. <laughs> Well, I married this little thing. And in five years, we had two boys, young kids, sitting in the back seat of a four-door Fairlane Ford. Stick shift. Cream color. Plastic seats. It was not pretty. <laughs> it was not pretty. And rather than her sitting close to me underneath the steering wheel, she was plastered back against her side on the passenger side of the car. And then she would say to me, Honey, why don't we sit close together like we used to? 
I don't know, babe, but it's not me that's moved. It's not me that's moved. You know, I remember a revival in Sugar Creek, Ohio, just outside of Ironton, back in the late 50s, with a revival. I've got pictures of it. The revival went for 16 weeks. 16 weeks. They baptized 250 people out of that meeting. We can't get revivals that will last three days today. It used to be a one-week revival, maybe two weeks revivals. I don't believe that God has to take 16 weeks to bring a revival. I don't believe that God has to take a week or three days or two days or even one hour. I believe God can bring a revival whenever, with whomever. I believe that. But the pictures that I have was that in the wintertime, they were baptizing converts in the creek where they had broken the ice. And a hundred people standing in top coats and hats and gloves in snow on the bank watching the baptisms. Our generation today probably never, ever, will ever see that happen. Not in our day. Unless there is true, genuine revival. First Baptist Church is familiar with revival. You've got one coming up in September. You need to be praying more than ever. You need to ask God to lay people upon your hearts more than ever. And when you leave and ready for that revival, you need to be ready to at least represent somebody on the outside of these walls to bring them in, to hear the preaching and the singing, and have the opportunity, if not already, to respond to the gospel message. If we don't have revival in America, we're faced with ruin. That's our challenge. And how we cope with that is simply this. Keep your hands to the plow, your knees bent, your eyes upon him, your ears open to his voice, your heart clean, your feet walking <coughs> with him and the Lord witnessing for him, and keep your nose in the book. And you'll see God's goodness to the fourth and fifth generation. Stay strong in spirit, soul, and mind and body, as to strengthen your brethren. Keep winning the lost to Jesus, baptizing believers in Jesus, and training disciples for Jesus. That's my message to you today. And that's my message for 32 churches in our association. That our churches and our association becomes a household name in our state. That we become the leading association in our state. Not just because we began with the letter B, but we're seeing more churches planted and we're seeing more churches added to the kingdom. And it's going to take more money to do that. Last year we just gave $1,000 per church plant. We are underwriting those church planters $200 a month. Out of our association, we can't continue to do that and do it on the same measure. We've got to have more help. We've got to have more givers. We've got to have more people that's interested in doing it if we're going to continue doing what God has asked us to do. And that's my job as a director of missions. And I pledge to you that, that uh, testimony to continue on until Jesus can allow me to live or until he calls me home. And I covet and I have an interest in your prayers. Would you bow your heads with me for a few moments? I want to thank you for your patience this morning. I want to thank you for your time. And I want to thank you for your prayers. This service today.